All right, we're live, guys. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for logging in tonight to watch our conversation with Paul Zolo and Louis Kemp. And gentlemen, um, I will let you take it away. If you have a chance, please feel free to ask any questions in our chat room, and we will get them answered for you. All right, gentlemen, take it away. Well, hello, everybody. This is Paul Zolo here in Los Angeles. It's great to be with Louis. Last time we were in the same space, but this is this is great, and I do want to show these guys off. I got two cute kitties. Who, who doesn't love kitties? Let's just, let's just play with the That's all. I, I can't hear very Get your grandson to turn up the volume so you can hear it, Louis. It's okay. Yeah, it's he, I told him to turn. Can, can you turn the volume up on your end? Yeah, I can hear you. Mine's all the way up. While Louis gets dialed in, let me tell you why we're here, because this guy, Louis Kemp, as people that know anything about Bob Dylan know, his oldest friend, literally his oldest oh, friend. They knew each other. Uh, no, Before Bob Dylan was Bob Dylan. He might not oh, change his name. And he wrote this wonderful book, Tim, Dylan Tim and Me. Fifty years of adventures. And in fact, it is that because they were childhood friends. But it didn't end there. He really was with Bob through many of the most and there are many through all the chapters of his life are pretty no, he's he's there. people like me who are obsessed by Bob. But uh, Louis was there through so many of the chapters, the last waltz, the conversion to Christianity, slow train coming, uh, so, so many things. There's so many different chapters, and, and he was at, at all of them. And, and Bob was at a lot of important parts of Louis's life, too. And it's a wonderful read, too. Uh, you know, there's so many Dylan books. There really are a lot. Uh, but this is the only one by someone that knew him since he was a kid uh, and, and wrote a wonderful book about it. So I'm so glad. Uh, thanks to Charles. Charles Legos and uh, Charles Lego and the California Capitol Film Office, who is uh, putting this together, that we can be with the great Louis Kemp tonight. Hi, Louis. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Paul. Oh. That's good. You know, that's pretty loud. Let me, let me hear. Let, let's tell, tell us how you're doing tonight, Louis. Let's hear how it sounds. So I'm good. I'm in Los Angeles and, uh, and um, happy to answer your questions and tell the people. You know about some of the adventures Bobby and I had together since we were eleven, going forward for fifty years. Yeah, you know it sounds really loud. Maybe your grandson can turn down your volume. Oh, oh it's too loud. Okay. Uh, hey. We had a great grandson here, which was great. Yeah, I think he disappeared I again. I mean, a grandson who is is great, but uh, there it is. I love that picture too. Tell me, what, what year about that was that picture? Yeah, that picture was taken in New York City in nineteen seventy two. Wow. Well, Louie, you met Bob, if I got it right, at Camp Herzl, which is a, a, a camp, a Jewish camp up in the Northwoods of Wisconsin. Is that right? That's, how it That's started. right. It was, uh, the camp is located just outside Webster, Wisconsin, in northern Wisconsin, and that was a co-educational Jewish camp. That's why we kept coming back for five years. There were girls there, you know. Oh. <laughs> it, was a, it, was, it was our introduction into, you know, into you really starting to have relationships with, with girls on a very superficial basis, but it was the beginning. Superficial is good. It's better than nothing. Yeah, you got to start that way. So, you know, Bob Dylan, as I think you probably know, not only such an important, influential musician, but so fascinating because he's enigmatic in so many ways and he's mysterious and, you know, people have a hard time figuring him out a lot. But you knew him long before that, before uh, he was even writing his own songs. That, that happened much later. Was he like that as a kid? What was he like when you met him? Okay, so just to set the uh, everything straight here, you know, I I know I knew and I know Bobby Zimmerman, not Bob Dylan. Okay. And, and they're totally different. So Bobby Zimmerman is, you know, my friend uh, from 11 and one of the boys. Bobby, Bob Dylan is the entertainer and the singer-songwriter. So, uh, as a kid, and, and going forward, Bobby Zimmer was just down to earth, a uh, good friend and a, and a good guy, you know, you know, a prankster, you know, likes to have fun, good sense of humor. <laughs> so that, that mysterious guy we know, is that, is that really him? Was he mysterious or is that something he developed when he be? I mean, when you say he's different than Bob Dylan, did he, did he develop that to distance himself from people? Well, you gotta remember, Bob Dylan doesn't talk on stage. He just sings, you know? That's how he expresses himself. Bobby Zimmerman, when he's with his friends, he talk for hours about anything. 
He's like, you know very he's very well read. He's very knowledgeable, and it's he's fun to be around. It seems from from reading your book and knowing you, that's one of the reasons Bob was so close to you because you knew him as that that person where other people didn't treat him that way, and you, you and you never took any shit from him either. You know, you you were always really uh, bringing him back to life in a way, back down to the ground. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I wasn't in awe of him, he was, you know, because he's my, my friend, you know, you know, you, nobody's in awe of their friends, might be in awe of some, somebody who is, you know, you, you admire for, for their work, though I never got into that crap either uh, with anybody, but uh, no, it's just, you know, friend to friend, you know, and, and, and he liked it that way, and I liked it that way, and that, that's the real deal. There's nobody that's known him as long as you because your friend Larry is gone. But there were really three, uh, three friends. Can you, can that's you right. Larry, he was very important. Yeah, Larry, Larry was a wild. The three of us were like the, the wild kids at camp, you know, and uh, the pranksters. And the three of us hit it off right away because we had all that in common. Larry had the musical uh, inclination in common with Bobby also, which I didn't. You know, and uh, Larry was a, a singer and and later a singer songwriter in his own right. But unfortunately, Larry, he's a he was wilder than us. When he was sixteen, he had a diving accident and he became a uh, you know, which is a sad thing. But he he adjusted and he you made a, a meaningful life for himself. So he had an accident. Can you can you start there again? Yeah, a diving accident down in Florida. In a, in a pool, right? Actually, he died off a he dived off a retaining wall from a hotel right into the uh, ocean down there, and and uh, he had gone out earlier, and the tide was in. Went back later. Nobody was around. He dived again off ten feet, feet high into three feet of water and broke his neck because the tide was out. He did, but he, we're from Minnesota. We don't know from tides, you know. And it was very moving in the book how Bob was really struck by that. He did not take that lightly. That really was a, a terrible thing for him to go through with, with Larry, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, both of us, but, by, but it, 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 uh, it brought tears to his eyes. And yet, as we know from the book, Larry wasn't defeated by that. He went on to do some great stuff, uh, you know, with, with his... Yeah, he got his master's degree in psychology. He ran some businesses. He had got married, had three kids, a singer-songwriter. He traveled all over. He really uh, led a full life. And then he's, he's no longer with us. So it's, you and Bob are the only ones that have that connection that far back. Yes. So there's a wonderful moment in the book when I think it was Larry, you know, when he was around, said he wanted to hear a song and Bob didn't want to play it. And you kind of just jumped on Bob and said, don't give me any of that Bob Dylan shit. You know, that you could do that. Too. Who else could do that? Well, that's right. I mean, because that's that was how how we were, you know. I mean, as kids, you know. And to me, nothing changed when, when he came uh, BD, you know. And, uh, and so I always responded to him like, like BC and and uh, and he responded back. He liked you know, it. Once... Feel good. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, as I mentioned, you were there through so many interesting chapters in his in his life, which are chapters in your book now. And you know, when he did Planet Waves, that was a real interesting one. He recorded that whole album, if I got it right, with the band at the Village Recorder in L.A. Very That's quickly, correct. Over a few days. You know, I should say before this, you know, Louie, because uh, you took over your dad's smoke fish company and you were doing well. So you could be with Bob. So you traveled with him all around the world. So it enabled you to be part of it. And uh, so you were part of the, the Planet Waves thing, right? You were there at the time? Yeah, what happened was I had come back from Alaska and gone to L.A. and I was hanging out with Bobby. And uh, he said, I'm going to the studio and uh, I'm going to be recording an album. He said, here's the address of the studio. Stop by whenever you want. So this girl that I was dating from San Francisco that came down to hang out with me also, and I said to her, and I'm going to read you from the book, the excerpt that uh, corresponds to that time. Great. A few weeks later, Steph visited me in L.A., and I thought it would be fun to take her to meet Bobby. 
we found him in the midst of a creative quandary. He had recorded two very different versions of the same song. He had been wrestling with which one to use on the record. He hadn't played the song for anyone yet. So it was by chance that Stephanie and I became the first people to hear Forever Young. Bob, said Stephanie after he finished playing both versions for us, quote, you're getting mushy in your old age. I waited to see how Bobby would respond to this rather flippant critique by a girl he just met. He looked at her somberly, then he laughed. And what do you think, Louie, he asked. I don't know which version you should use, I said, but I think it's one of the best songs you've ever written. I couldn't possibly have known it then, but that song has taken on meaning, more meaning for me with every tomorrow I live. I imagine it speaks to almost everyone at some point in his, his or her life, whether it's the birth of their children, the passing of parents, or just the feeling of getting older. That's beautiful. Not only were you there, but you wrote a great book about it. You really wrote it in a, in a wonderful way. And remarkably, if I got this right, you did it pretty quickly, the writing. Isn't that yeah, it took me about six months, but it wasn't hard to write because my memory is intact. And uh, I just had to search my the vacuums of my memory and, and spit it all out, you know, and that's what I did. You got it done because a lot of people have memories, but to write a whole book. I know people have been writing their book forever and it's never going to end, but it's a, it's a great one. Uh, are there are there parts about Bob that uh, secrets or parts of him that you didn't share that you didn't want to put in the book? No, I put everything in the book that you know I felt comfortable writing, uh, and uh, and as you know, those are all great stories. There's nothing else that I would have or wanted to put in there that, would, that should have been in there. Well, one one reason I love the book is it really gives you a sense of the guy. Where you know, there's been a lot of books by people that that didn't know him. You know, I, I interviewed him once, you know, for two hours, and I've been talking about that two hours for, for a long time. It, it had a big impact on me. But to, 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 to come like you did, to know him since you were a kid, but to maintain that relationship is, is so special. Uh, you know, another thing I want to ask you about is when he was doing uh, Blood on the Tracks, and he, he did Idiot Win. He, you were part of that as well. I mean, you were talking about Forever Young, that there were two versions, and I, I don't know if people know that he put both versions on the album. They're both. Yes, he did. That's what he ended up doing. I think maybe the slower version is the one that just goes. But uh, Idiot Win, too. He recorded it a few times and wasn't sure if he got it right. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, I'll, I'll read you the excerpt from the book yeah. that corresponds to Idiot Win. So it goes like this. It's chapter eight. The, the name of the chapter is Will the Real Idiot... Please stand up. And it, come, it goes like this. Coming off of Tour 74, Bobby's creative juices were flowing big time. When I came back from Alaska in July, I went to see Bobby at his place outside Minneapolis. And he played me the songs he had written. These would constitute his critically acclaimed album, Blood on the Tracks. And I was one of the first people to hear them. He sat across from me on a chair with his acoustic and played the album for me. Then he said to me, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young are playing tonight in St. Paul. Do you want to go with me? And I thought to myself, do I want to go with you? There's a bear shit in the woods. Of course I want to go with you. We went to the concert, which was at the St. Paul Civic Center. Afterwards, we went to the hotel where the band was staying, Bill Graham and Barry Amoff were the tour promoters. They also were on Tour 74 with us. So we had a chance to see and visit with them as well. After a while, Bobby mentioned to Stephen Stills that he had just written some new songs. And of course, Stephen wanted to hear them. So Bobby, Stephen, and I went into the bedroom of the suite, and Bobby played a few songs. Stephen was obviously loaded. And when Bobby sang Idiot Win, he became paranoid and very agitated. You wrote that song about me, he shouted. Why did you write that song about me? He jumped up and got right into Bobby's face. 
As Bobby's friend and self-appointed protector, I jumped in between them so Stephen couldn't get any closer. Carefully, I eased Stephen back. Bobby just laughed and said, Relax, man, the song's not about you, as he continued to sing and strum without missing a beat. Millions of people around the world identify personally with Bobby's songs and feel as if he is speaking directly to them. But few of them are low enough to think the songs were actually written about them. Good thing you're there to protect him during that, too. Well, he can he can no, protect no, himself as he has to. That's Stephen Stills. He, that's that's funny though. But. It's a, it was a funny moment, a funny story, and uh, okay. as I look back on it, yeah. did you find out who he did write this song for by any by any means. Oh, I had no idea. I don't ask him who he writes the songs about. I went above many songs, but that one is so pointed. You know, it's such an amazing song, but quite a few are. So so let me ask you. Knowing him as a kid, and you made a point of saying, you know, there's Bobby Zimmerman, who I knew, and Bob Dylan. But Bobby Zimmerman did become that guy. He did write all those songs. So is it someone who knew him, did that seem right to you? Or I mean, how did you accept it when you realized, boy, this guy is really doing some important, amazing work here? Yeah, well, what happened was, uh, like in 1963, I'm in Duluth, and I'm listening to the radio in my car, and all of a sudden... Uh, blowing it, blowing in the wind comes on the radio with Bobby singing it. And I said to myself, how the hell did he do that? You know, I mean, it, was, it blew me away like it blew everyone else away and still blows people away when they first hear it, hear it again. So it was at that point that, you know, I first became aware of his ability uh, to write that kind of music and they just kept coming, you know. When you realize that, and then he became really famous, and not just famous, but you know, really held up as a, a very important, like, almost like a prophet. You were still, when you would get back with him, you were still able to connect with him. Uh, and well, we got back him. together. It was just uh, Bobby Zimmer and Louis Camp. You know, there was there was no change. <laughs> I mean, you were even at the the last waltz, and if I got this right, I, and if people don't know the last waltz, the famous uh, movie that Scorsese directed of the band's last thing, and the great ending of it is Bob Dylan performing. Does does for every young, by the way. And if I got it right, you you provided Louis the the great to salmon. You you brought a lot of salmon to that. Yeah, I had become friendly with Bill Graham because I was on tour seventy four, and uh, and so once you know Bobby, what happens? I went to his house. He said, "Be at my house, you know, at such and such a time." Well, he invited me to go on the tour, and we uh, I went there. We hung out for a while with his family and then a limo came and took us to the airport. We pulled up to the tarmac where this this chartered plane uh, for the tour plane. Bobby gets out and Bill is fussing over him and then all of a sudden I get out of the limo and uh, Bobby had forgot to tell anybody that he was bringing a friend with. So Bill looks at me and says, who's this? And uh, Bobby says, this is my friend Louie, he's coming on the tour. And you know, everybody was scrambling. Who's this guy? What do we do with him? You know, but uh, once Bill realized, you know, how close we were, he set up a, a rocking chair on stage right behind Levon Helm, and I sat on stage uh, in that rocking chair for for that whole tour. So that was quite an experience as well. And, and then after the tour, Bill sent me that rocking chair with a uh, with a plaque on it. So. Uh, during, during the last waltz, too, Bob didn't want all the songs on film, correct? And you were the guy that had to intercede, right? Yeah, we're backstage, and uh, he's visiting with people. Everybody's coming up to say hello to him, all the entertainers, and Governor Jerry Brown was there, and everybody's fussing. And, uh, and then, unknown to me, he, he goes up to Bill and says, he was, Bill thought he was going to sing four songs, and they would be recorded by Marty for the movie. And apparently they had told Warner Brothers that, and that's how they got the financing. So he goes to Bill and he says, Bill, I decided I only want to be recorded two of my songs. And Bill went bonkers and said, well, we, need, we told Warner Brothers you're going to do four. We need that, blah, blah, blah. 
And as hard as he tried to persuade him, Bobby said, no, that's what I decided. And then he says, turning to me, he says, and Louie is going to go on stage next to you and Marty and the cameras and make sure that you only record two songs of mine. <laughs> that's the first time I heard about you. So he, so I did. He sent me up to be as a enforcer. I stood, you know, right next to Bill and Marty in the camera room. And uh, the idea was that he's not going to record the first two, but the last two. So I made them turn the cameras around. I made the cameraman come down from, from their perches down to, to the stage level. And I said, I'll let you know when you can record. And they were going nuts. So, you know. so after the first two songs, I said, okay, go up, record. And uh, they went up there and they started recording. And what Bobby did surprised everybody. He swung back into the first song, and uh, you know, it, it surprised the band and everybody. And uh, so I said to Bill, "I stop recording," and 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 uh, he Bill started yelling at me, "No, this is history. This is my show. You can't tell me what to do." He says. I'm not stopping recording. And he grabbed me and he started shaking me. And so I grabbed him, I started shaking him. So we're actually tussling on the side of the stage. Wow. But the cameras are rolling, you know. And to make a long story short, he sang another song. And so they got four songs out of it. He sang Baby, Don't Let Me Follow You Down Twice. Is that the one? Yeah, that's what he did. <laughs> he put you, I mean, not only his friend, but in tough positions. You had to be that guy for him. Yeah, it's just a part of being a friend for anybody. You cover for them, whatever they need to cover their back. <laughs> uh, he knew he knew he could count on me, and no matter what the situation. People have this idea of him as just being a, you know, not connected to life, maybe being above everything. And it was surprising in his book. He talked about when he was on tour with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers that he had this crisis of confidence and felt he couldn't sing for a while. And you just think Bob Dylan's on top of the world, but. You know him. Is, is he a humble guy, or does he, does he have an understanding of uh, how important he is? Well, one of the things I, I like about him the most and always have is that he's very humble. You know, he doesn't have any ego. Uh, he doesn't have any attitude. He knows, and the reason for that is he knows that this gift that he has to write these songs that are amazing uh, are a gift from God. And he always would say to me, he'd say, I, I don't get any credit for this. I, they just come in my head that from God. He gets all the credit. So that's his humility comes from that understanding and that uh, recognition. And he, lived, he has lived uh, his life with, with, with that attitude. And I think, this is my opinion, that the reason he, he's, we're talking 60 years later, why he's able to write an album like he just wrote, and I've read a lot of the reviews on him, and they're all five stars. It's amazing. At 79 years old, is that because he kept the humility all those years, that God has continued to bless him with with that uh, light and that ability. He didn't take it away from him. You see, many singers they get one good song, one good album, a few years, it's over. You know, the blessing is gone. Uh, Bobby's kept this blessing for 60 years. I think a big part of it is, is because of his humility. Yeah, absolutely. It is remarkable. So many decades of great music. And like you said, new new songs now. Pretty intense songs. The one about JFK, Murder So Foul, and I Contain Multitudes. And he's still doing it, huh? Yeah, he's still got the gift. And, and the gift is a blessing, and he knows that. So God's still on his side. There are several Dylan Fests. I'm in one often every year that Andy Hill and Renee Safer put on it. It's a whole day of Dylan music. They never repeat one song. You know, it goes all day. And just think one guy wrote all those songs. I mean, he's already done such an enormous body of work. It's amazing, really. Well, I think it's 39 studio albums, right? <laughs> uh, you, you had to deal with the business, too, somewhat. Like Walter Yetnikoff you dealt with, right? It was a... Was he yes, yeah, so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll read you a little excerpt from the book about that. What happened was that Bobby had asked me after Tour 74 if I would produce Rolling Thunder for him, uh, basically because when he was in New York doing Desire, he asked a few promoters there, uh, he had this idea and he explained to him, you know, 
and they all say, oh, no, you're too big for that. You can't, to, you have to do a big money tour. And he said, no, no, I don't want to do that. He said, I, I want to do a people tour, you know, small places, uh, all the way places, just to be fun, like a caravan, like a old fashioned review, you know. And every, everybody said, no, you, you can't do that. You're Bob Dylan. So he, you know, he knew that who he was and what he wanted to do. So he, he pitched me. He said, you were on Tour 74 with me. You saw how it works. You're a successful businessman. I want you to produce this for me. So, so, so I said yes after we went back and forth a little bit talking about it. And uh, then we were in New York doing the pre-tour rehearsing and stuff. And, and by that time, he had decided to uh, do a movie on the tour. So we lined up a, a movie crew, got a hold of Sam Shepard, brought him in to help write some uh, uh, script for it. Uh, and, uh, and so our, our, our budget kept growing because all of a sudden we had a big movie crew. And, and we would go out in the village every night in the city and to clubs. And he'd see people that he knew. And even new people, and he didn't invite them to come on the tour. We we were supposed to be like, I don't know, forty people. We end up a hundred people. Like, <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. Wow. And but it was fun. It was that all part of this carnival, you know, concept that he had and that yeah. we that I had bought into with him. Yeah, so I said to him one day, I said, Bobby, you know, our our, our budget's growing. Doing... Yeah, I said our budget's growing. I said I'm going to. Uh, I think I'm going to go up to Columbia Records and talk to the president and see if they'll uh, help uh, add some promotional money for the tour because fit because uh, they got your your whole well, your all your records they're going to sell lots of records off this tour you know all these cities where we go and all the publicity and everything and so Bobby said well, I don't know if they do that but that'd be great if you get them to do it so I asked uh, Naomi who ran his office I said. Uh, Who's the president of, of uh, Columbia Records? I didn't even had no idea. I'm a fish guy, you know. Who's the president of Columbia Records? Cool. And uh, she said, well, uh, his name's Walter Yetnikov. She said, why do you want to know? I said, well, I'm going to go up and see him and see if I can get Columbia to uh, kick in some money for the tour, promotional-wise. She said, oh, no, they won't do that. She said, I've asked them times before, and they, and they would never do it. I said, well, it doesn't hurt the you know, give me the number, I'll try. And she laughed at me. She didn't laugh with me. She laughed at me like this naive kid from Duluth, you know, you know, he's not going to get anything. So anyway, I she gives me the number. I call up there. I get over the secretary, told her, you know, this is Louie Kemp. I'm, uh, I'm producing a tour for Bob Dylan. He's going out here shortly. I want to meet with Walter uh, to see if... Uh, we can coordinate, uh, you know, the promotion for the tour with, with Columbia. She said, oh, she said, what's your number? I'll call you back. She calls me back 30 minutes later and said, Mr. Yetnik, I'd be happy to meet with you. She said, when do you want to come up? I said, I'll be there tomorrow. So I went up there. And now I'm in his office. I'm not going to read you some of that. So I was telling Walter about the tour, how different it was and everything. And this isn't going to be your regular tour. And... Uh, and he was very gracious and nice and everything until I got to this point. Before, and he was when I was telling him what the story was going to be like, he was just blown away, and and rambling on about how great he thought the concept was. Before I could get a word in, Yetnikov barreled, barreled on. Tour seventy four was amazing. His blood on the tracks album was brilliant, and I understand from Don DeVito that he has another album coming. If you give us the itinerary, I'll get back to you with our ticket needs for for each concert. Let me just pause for a, a second here to clarify that in those days, before the internet and social media and all, record companies relied heavily on radio DJs and record store owners to promote shows. In order to get them talking, they handed out lots of complimentary tickets. Well, Walter, I said, when he came up for air, this tour is going to be a, a lot different from any previous ones. In fact, we think it's going to make history. You see, the shows will be in small venues, and the lineup will be kind of freeform. We only go, we're only going to announce the shows and sell tickets a few days before they happen. In fact, even the performers on the tour won't know where the shows are going to be. 
We're going to break all the rules, make the shows all about the music and the audience, not the promoters and the label. And by the way, we'll be shooting a movie of the whole thing. Walter's eyes had been getting wider and wider as I talked. And when I finished, he couldn't suppress a huge smile. Before he could frame a response, I added, Anyway, Walter, maybe you're wondering why I'm here. I'm not just here to coordinate. We're going to need $100,000 from Columbia to help support tour expenses. The smile vanished. We don't do that, he said. If we did that for Bob, we'd have to do that for everyone. Well, that's too bad, I cut in, because if I can't count on Columbia to be a good supportive partner for Bob and the tour, then we are going to be able to supply you with the itinerary or any tickets. But he explained, we have to have tickets. We have to know where Bob is going to be playing. We're his label. We'd be humiliated if we weren't part of this. Maybe it seems crazy considering to whom I was talking and where I was standing, but I was feeling pretty bold. Walter, I said quietly, if you don't show Bob your good faith by putting some of your cash in the pot, then you can find out about the tour in the paper or on the radio, just like everybody else. Who knows, if you work at it, you can probably score some tickets on the street. You remember I'm talking to Walter Yetnikov, the, the, the biggest guy in the music business at this time. Well, with that, I turned to lock out of his office, secretly hoping he'd stop me, which is exactly what he did. Okay, okay, he yelled. We'll contribute 100000 but we need access. Yes, all right, Walter, I said, still deadpan. Please have the check delivered to Bob's office tomorrow. I'll leave the address with your assistant. It'll be there, he said. Negotiating with Walter wasn't really that different from dealing with the Japanese, to whom I sold most of my Alaskan fish. If you had what they wanted, they would eventually pay your price. When I told Naomi to expect the check, she was in shock. The whole hundred thousand? How do you get him to pay that? I just smothered him in love and kindness, I replied. Of course, Bobby was happy too. Good job, Louie, he said. Then went back to his job, which was being Bob Dylan. <laughs> and then the check showed up soon after that? The check was there the next morning, wow. just like he said. Wow. You even got the check. That's pretty good. You... Yeah, you got to remember, this is 1975. That's like $500,000 today. It was big money. And Yetnikov, he was he was kind of crazy, wasn't he? He was a wild guy. He was yeah. a tough guy. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, he was up against two guys from Duluth. No match for us. <laughs> I guess the Bob recognized that in you, that you could do that. Yeah, he knew me. But it was the Japanese. Is that what really... You know, honed that skill. To yeah, I used to sell. I you know I had this operation in Alaska. I used to sell all my fish and caviars to them. They were tough negotiators, and uh, I was able to to handle them. And and I, I learned from that experience that you know you had to hold out once you understood what you you know that they wanted what you wanted had. And I figured the same thing with Walter. Uh, Louis is frozen. Is it still frozen? I can I can see him. Just a message here. I hope uh, hope everyone can see. Okay, uh, you know we we didn't talk about talking about this part, but one of my favorite parts of the book is when Bob's going through his what's known as the born again part of his life, and he's getting converted to Christianity. This famous Jewish boy, you know, went got bar mitzvah and all you, but you were with him at that time. If I, if I got it right, you were living together in a different house. And you were going through an especially uh, religious period yourself uh, in Judaism, and you and Bob would have debates. Is that correct? Can you, can you talk about that? Time yeah. Again? So what happened is Bobby had a house in Brentwood that he rented, so he could stay in the city when I drive back to Malibu, and he invited me to move in with him because I had been renting a condo in Westwood. He said, "You don't need this condo." He used to come over. He said. Uh, you know, move in with me. I got plenty of room. So I did. And I, and I lived with him for three years. And it was 
during this period, when he was going through this uh, uh, New Testament uh, experience. And what happened was, during that period, early on, I went back to Minnesota, met Rabbi Manus Friedman, and I studied with him extensively. And, and at the end of that period of time, I decided to become Orthodox uh, Jewish, you know, observant. Uh, I had been conservative, but now I became you know, Orthodox. And when I moved back, when I went back to the house, it was quite interesting. Bobby was on one side of the house studying the New Testament. I was on the other side of the house studying the Old Testament. And then we'd meet in the kitchen and kind of debate each other, you know, try to you know convince each other about what we were. So to make a long story short, I, I couldn't keep up with him. He had been doing this longer than me. And so I went in another room after one of these discussions. And I called my rabbi back in Minnesota. And I said, Rabbi, I have a friend who's studying the New Testament. I, I can't... Uh, I can't debate with him about it. If if I fire you out here, if I get you a tickle, you come out here and meet with him. And I didn't tell him who my friend was. And he said, sure, you want me to come out? I'll come out. So the next day I said, Bobby, my rabbi's going to be here next week. Uh, would you like to meet him? He's a very knowledgeable, smart uh, uh, person. He said, sure, bring him to the house. So I flew him in. I picked him up there, airport, brought him to the house. And him and Bobby got along great. And that was the beginning of the process of Bobby starting to study Torah and Talmud and and, and uh, the Jewish learning, which he had never done before, and I hadn't either prior to recently. And uh, and you know we used to go to Crown Heights, see the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and introduce some other rabbis. And you know, Bobby's like a sponge; once he starts to study something, he absorbs it. You know, he's very bright and he's very inquisitive, and uh, he, he's very spiritual. Yeah, that is fascinating. I keep looking around because the cats are making noise, you know, and I hope uh, it's not annoying. Well, they're probably hungry. Did you feed them? Oh, yeah, they've been eating a lot. Oh, okay. But let me ask you about that, though. So, I mean, he did go through that, and he wrote amazing songs. You know? He did. You know, being Jewish, I thought, I wish he would come back to us, but they were great songs. Well, but he did come back. He did. Then you brought him back with your rabbi, but... Uh, do you think he was drawn to that more for the literature and the words and the poetry of it, or did, did he authentically uh, go, go through a, a spiritual change? Yeah, oh. I think his soul was searching for a spiritual fulfillment, just like mine was when I started study with the rabbi, and I knew there was more to life than just uh, making a lot of money and having good times and possessions and being with girls, you know, beautiful girls and all that stuff. Uh my, my my soul was screaming out for more meaningful fulfillment. I think his was too, and and I think that's what happened. And I was wondering, did the rabbi did it take him a long time to persuade Bob? Did they have a long uh, debate before that happened? Well, they had, yeah, at that meeting they had a discussion, you know, and uh, you know the rabbi was able to, to respond to his questions with answers that he'd never heard before, just like I had the same experience with him the month before, and. Uh, and it got his, it got his curiosity, it got his interest. So, uh, the rabbi lived in St. Paul, and Bob used to come there a lot. His, and uh, he would start studying with him back then, and with another rabbi introduced him back then, and the rabbi in New York. And he, you know, once he gets into something, you know, he gets the books, he starts reading, you know, he uh, he digested it. <laughs> and. It so the rabbi didn't know it was him until he actually walked in? And well, I think I told him just before I introduced him. You know, when I was driving him to the house, I said, my friend's name is... But, but the rabbi wasn't impressed. These people live in, their, in a spiritual world. You know, it, it, it's, it, you know, they heard his name. He probably didn't know it, his songs. You know, maybe he heard Boy in the Wind or something. But, you know, didn't know his volume of work. He knew he was a famous uh, musician, but that's about it. Mm-hmm. Because not only was he famous, he, he I, I see him, he changed the arc of popular songwriting. I mean, he is such an influential, important figure in, in songwriting, too. Uh, what, as, as you went with him, were, did you have favorite albums of his? Were the ones that you liked the best or, or songs? Yeah, you know, I guess the best thing I can say is, uh, you know, obviously, some of his albums, you know, really spoke to me, but on the tracks for sure did. And also uh, Planet Waves, you know, I was there during both of those. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I went to hundreds of his concerts, and and you know, 
his work uh, resonated with me. But I'm not a music guy. I'm a fish guy. <laughs> In Blood on the Tracks, famously, is the one he, he came back to Minneapolis, you know, that his brother David. So kind of a hometown album in some ways that he did. Well, it. he recorded the, the last five songs in in the Twin Cities. Yeah. Yeah. So it it has that. I mean, that's that's your. Interest. Yes, it does. I, his first performance in your book, you, you told, it's at camp when he gets up on the roof of a, a building. Is that right? Yeah. So we're at camp. He, I think it was the last year we were there because I said we were there for five years. Remember, and the, the last year. Um, He's 17 by then. I'm 16. And they, the camp had a, a day where they would switch. The, the campers and the counselors would change places, you know, to give the campers an experience of responsibility and, and uh, so forth. So Bobby changed places with Shlomo, uh, the music director. And he became the music director for the day at the camp. And though he had always... You know, he has a guitar there and he, he would play it. But this day, he decided to get up on the top of the roof of, of the activities building called the Ulam in Hebrew and stayed up there all day singing songs, you know, rock and roll, uh, blues songs, you know. And he, he had a great knowledge of, of all these different songs, even at, at that age. And, uh, and all day long, the campers and concerts would walk by in the courtyard and uh, he, he serenade him. And this was like 1957. This was on the roof. So he was the original fiddler on the roof. <laughs> this was before he started writing. Was and, he, and a lot of it was rock and roll. Is that right? He's playing like. Oh, yeah. He, you know, he was into Little Richard Little and uh, Jerry Lewis and, and all those guys. Jack Berry. Did, did you guys go to, to Temple together, to Sunday school? Well, he grew up in Hibby, and I grew up in Duluth, 75 miles away, so we didn't go to that together. But, uh, you know, later in life, we would, we, we did. You know. After I became, you know, after we became, well, I got a great story in the book about how I took him to a, a Seder yeah, it was with, with Marlon Brando. Tell us about that. <laughs> that's a great story but yeah it is a good story. story it is a good book, story by the way if you just tuned in it's called dylan and me 50 years of adventures and that's that's a good title because you did a, a lot of adventures with oh, that's what the book is it's, it's all one adventure after another all true stuff yeah. well that I'll, I'll try and condense that one i i had became friends with marlon brando because his son christian uh came to work for me in Alaska. Uh, Mar uh, Marlon was friends with Helena Kellyantes, who was who was very close with Jack Nicholson. And uh, Jack and Marlon lived in the same compound up on Mulholl. So, and she had, and Marlon had told her on some occasion that he wanted to get his, his son out of LA because he was running around the fast Hollywood kids crowd and he was afraid, you know, he's going to get in trouble. So he says to Helena, who I was friendly with, uh, do you know any real people? You know, not Hollywood people. You know, they have a real business someplace outside LA where he, where my son Christian can go work, good, honest job. And Helena said, well, I know this guy uh, who has a fish business in Alaska. Well, Marlon said, Alaska, that's perfect. <laughs> That'd be perfect. I want to meet him. So Helena calls me. And says, uh, you know, Marlon Brando would like to meet you. Uh, possibility of sending his son up to Alaska. I said, I'll talk to him about it. So, so she said, I, I, I went up to Jack Nicholson's house at the time that she asked me to come a few days later. And we're sitting, Helene and I are sitting there talking. And then Marlon walks in. And uh, <laughs> this was just a, a few years after the Godfather movie. So, uh, she introduces us, and Marlon says to me, I hear you have a fish business in Alaska. I said, yeah, that's right. He said, I have a son. I want him to go work for you in Alaska. <laughs> he said, well, I'll tell you what, Marlon. 
because you asked me, I'll give him the job. But only he can keep that job. If he can work hard and fit in with everybody else, no, he's not going to get any special considerations once he's there. He's either going to keep the job or get sent home on his own merit. Or, and that's going to be it. He said, don't worry about anything. I guarantee you he'll work hard. I promise you. I said, okay. Give me the information. I'll have my guys call, get them a ticket. And it was a... Oh, he's frozen. Let me hold on. Hold on a second. He froze in mid-story. What if we re refresh or something? Louis, can you refresh or something? <laughs> That's a long one. Well, in the meantime, let's let's have kitty time. Hello, kitty. They're making a racket, aren't they? They're not being very helping very much. That was a good story too. We didn't quite get to there. If we can do anything. Hey, Hello, everyone. Going. This is a a perfect time to plug the book. So if you haven't purchased your copy of Bob Dylan or Dylan and Me: Fifty Years of Adventure, there is a link right below the screen here. A little green button that you can purchase a signed copy from Louis Kemp uh, on our bookstore. And uh, it looks like Louis Kemp is actually uh, refreshing his browser now. So we will be back up and running in just a moment. Thank you so much for your patience. Yeah. <laughs> it's enough. Don't talk about me so much. <laughs> All right. Pretty cool. Though. See I mean, the, the stuff that he knows about this guy. Who else could write Brian? this book? I mean, he really knows the guy. I mean, you could tell Bob trusted him too, that he asked him to do all those big jobs for him. And, cool. and then also, if uh, if anyone has any questions, um, there is a question tab on the bottom here. It looks like we already have a question for Louis uh, okay. for okay. if he's been interviewed uh, for the Scorsese documentary. So as soon as he's back on, maybe we can ask him some questions and feel free to ask yeah. any questions in the any question tab. Like Neil Rosengarten, Bradley Bobbs, Howell, Howard Gottlieb. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we will be back up and running shortly. Sorry about this. Let's see, where is he? Louie, Louie. Lost Louie again. I can show some other pictures. There's some of the text. You see, it's very, it's beautifully laid out. Louis told me he wrote this on his phone. See, this bothers me because I use, you know, like actual, like a, I used to use a typewriter. But, uh, Louis looked pretty cool with Bob back then. I mean, he you know, was cool. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can hear the kittens out there. I hope you can. This is Joan Baez. You know, at the same time they were doing Rolling Thunder, they were shooting what became Ronaldo and Clara, which was originally four hours long. And Joan Baez played Sarah, his wife, and Sarah played, I think, Joan Baez. It was, I don't know what it was. It was quite an amazing movie, but uh, it's overwhelming for most humans. I'd like to see it again. And uh, there's that. What a great book. Oh, good. There's more. <laughs> hey, there's Louie. Hey, Louie. Hello. Oh, something happened. I disappeared. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, those in the middle of, uh, telling us about uh, his son that came to uh, to work for you, and then, then what? Then what happened? Yeah. Well, then you know, I don't know where I, where you asked me, but so I became friendly with Mario, and he asked me. He called me all the time to check up on his son, and he. We and, got that, that you hired him, right? Yeah, I hired him, and then when I'd be in L.A., Mario and I would get together, and. One time he invited me to dinner. He said, uh, I'll take you out to dinner. I said, no, no, I'm going to a Seder. Oh, Paso, I want to go to the Seder. So he said, can I come with? I said, okay, meet me at the hotel at such and such a time. Then an hour later, Bobby called. I said, what are you doing tonight? I said, I'm going to a Seder. It's Passover. He said, oh, I want to come too. So, <laughs> so I said, okay, be at the hotel. I said, Marlon Brando's coming too. And uh, we went. And it was an amazing uh, experience, and I go into detail about it in the book. Like a good Seder. It was amazing. It was like it was like being in a Fellini movie. 
So th- there's things about Bob we, we wonder. I mean, he had several kids. Was was he a good dad? He was a great dad. Yeah. Totally dedicated to his kids. Always. I think it would be tough to be one of his kids. I mean, it's such, not a, just a famous person, but, you know, the source of Yeah, not because of him. Yeah, he was totally loving and took the kids to baseball games and did all kinds of things with them. You know, if, if there was any difficulty, it was because of what other people thought. Not because how Bobby acted. He was a great father. He is a great father. And is it right? He always kept a place uh, in the Midwest uh, near Minneapolis, right? And go there often, right? Yes. Yeah, he always stay. He always stay grounded with his Minnesota roots. Yeah. Still, does he still do that? Do you know. I think he still goes. There. He still has his place there now. So, if you guys are watching, you do have any questions? I don't see any, but if anyone can uh, send them in for Louis, we're happy to take them. Uh, you know, you, you said how you knew him as Bobby Zimmerman and then he became Dylan. Did you feel funny that he changed his name? Or At first he tried to change his whole origin story. I mean, how did that make you feel? Uh, yeah, he went into the he went into entertainment business. So, you know, he, he made that uh, change. No big deal. That was perfectly understandable to me. But he, he made a big deal out of it, you know, in that song, God, like you're really Zimmerman. But he was yeah. himself. It was just a name change, right? That's all it was. Yeah. It was just a professional change. It had nothing to do with the person, yeah. There seems to be that time, you know, when he did a self-portrait and that he it was too much, you know, the fame. It got too big for him and he wanted to distance himself. Have you felt that with him at times that it was just too much and he needed to get away from it? We didn't, we didn't talk about that, but he, he it was obvious he didn't want to be sucked into all that stuff that they tried to put on his head, you know, a prophet, the messiah, all that crap. You know, he didn't buy into any of that. He knew better. Did he pur- purposely put a self-portrait out so people would leave him alone? That's the idea. I, I, I can't comment. I don't know. How about the motorcycle accident? Did he did he talk to you about that? No, we never got into much detail about that. <laughs> uh, you know, there, there's so many, you know, mysteries about him, so thank you for indulging us. Uh, uh, you know when when you, when you think of him now, like what what stands out to you most? It, one thing Tom Petty says that he said Bob Dylan is an honest guy. He might not tell you a lot about himself, but he won't lie about himself. He's a very honest person. Is, is that your experience? Yeah. Well, my, what stands out, you know, bring it up to to today is what I was referring to before. That sixty years later, after all the adoration that thrown on him. All the accomplishments, all the awards, all the, the Nobel Prize, you, you name it, uh, and then come up with a record like this at, at this stage of his life doesn't doesn't phase him at all. It doesn't take it seriously on a personal basis. He knows he's a conduit for a gift that he's been blessed with from God, and that all the credit goes to God. And that's what I admire about him the most as a person. And that's true and that he feels that. I, I, I believe that's true. You know, I, I, and yet he really crafts the songs. I think people think it just comes out of nowhere, but like they did this big thing on Blood on the Tracks and you can see how he kept changing the songs and they have intricate rhyme schemes. And he really was diligent. He really worked hard. On yeah, well, when you're given a gift, you have to work at it too, you know, and God gives you the blessing and expects you to put in the elbow grease and he's done that. And it, you think he keeps doing it because because he, he loves it? Is that his passion? I mean, what drives him? Do you think? I remember asking him years ago, you know, why do you tour so much? He says, "That's what I do," and that's what he does. That's his that's, that's his craft in life. You know? That's his gift. You know, and so he, some people might do two months a year if that, but he's been on what they call the never-ending tour. He just keeps going for years. I mean, uh, do, do do you know? Does he enjoy it? Is is that part of it? Does he like being out there? Yeah, he does. Yeah. You know, everybody when they come to this world are given certain gifts and they have the opportunity to live up to that potential of of those gifts. Some people live up to it. Some people don't. Some people get lazy. Some people don't want to put in the work. He's not like that. He's not lazy and he's he's willing to make the most of the gift he's been given. Yeah, he's definitely not lazy. No, not at all. Never has been. He's written a huge amount of work, too. I don't think people know just how many songs over the years, and songs that many people have recorded. We do have a question for you from Howell Gottlieb. 
they want to know if you were interviewed for the Scorsese documentary about Bob. The answer to that question is no. No. Scorsese did one on, he did two actually, but he did one on Rolling Thunder as well. Did, did you see that one? Uh, I, I think that's what he was talking about, the Rolling Thunder documentary. I did that one. Yeah. That was such a fascinating tour. It was cool that you were a part of that. A well, I had the good fortune uh, to, to produce it, you know, which, uh, you know, as I look back upon my career, it's, you know, one of the things I really enjoyed. You know? And as we know, he wasn't just making a, a movie about the tour. He was creating Ronaldo and Clara at the same time. Mm -hmm. Long, four-hour fictional, like a long Bob Dylan song. Do you know what drove him to that? And what was that like that he's filming while you're on tour? That must have made things kind of crazy. Huh? No, well, just uh, like I said, the guy's not lazy. He's a total creative force. You know, he paints, he welds, he sings, he writes music. He, he, he likes to do movies. You know, he's a total, you know, every part of him is creative. So he figures as long as we're out there, let's take a camera crew with and make a movie. So that's what we did. That's what he did. With everyone being uh, different characters and all, it's amazing. Yep. Is it true I hear that he does welding, like these giant gates that he can make big giant gates that he, uh, he well, is, is that? Yeah, he does that. That's, that's unusual. Uh, so uh, tell us about the book, though. You, I'm so glad we could do another book event, but you got to talk about the book around. How has that been for you? Because as, as you can tell, obviously, people are interested in them, and they have a lot of intense questions about this guy what's that like for you well you know this book is my memoir and it has a lot of stuff in it about bob and a lot of stuff in it about me as well you know that it doesn't affect bob uh so it was fun going back and kind of reliving uh you know that 50 year period of my life and and uh and i and i enjoy it you know you know i'm one of these people that i don't forget the past i live in the present and i look forward to the future that's nice. If people want to get the book, what's the best? What's the best way? I mean, we know usually, but can they go get it directly from you? Or? Yeah, they can. Well, they can get it on Amazon.com. And they can they can get it right here, right there. They can get it right there. There's a bookstore attached to this uh, website. Yeah, that's the best way. And yeah, they can get they can get that. Yeah, good. And uh, hopefully, uh, with the lockdown ending soon, you could be out doing more events. Uh, you think that's going to happen? Yeah, I do. I've been approached by quite a few. Uh, organizations and places to, to come and speak and, and hold book events and, you know, do signings and that, and I've agreed to do some, and uh, and I enjoy it. it it's, it's fun to meet people, and, and, and be, most the people that come are very enthusiastic, and, and I enjoy being able to uh, answer their questions and, and talk with them. You know, you're a very uh, spiritual, philosophical guy. You talk to the rabbi a lot. Does he have a, a you know, way of explaining your your life that you, you you obviously it seems that you were meant to be this guy to be close to that that guy and and, and tell his story in a way in a way you make him more human for us I mean, how, how do you see it you know i i see that everybody has a mission in this world and uh, it's a question if we live up to that mission if we embrace it if we make the most of it you know my mission is multifaceted uh you know, I've got six kids, five grandchildren, one on the way. You know, I'm an observant Jew. Uh, I had a, a, you know, big uh, fish business history. You know, I used to have hundreds of employees in business in Alaska and Minnesota. And I, you know, brought one of the main people, one of the first people to bring imitation crab to the United States. You know, you know and and another one of my things that uh, I did is to have a lot of good friends, and one of them. Turn out to be Bobby Zimmerman. <laughs> so it's it's, it's, it's really a eclectic life that I've had so far. Yeah, well, it's a it's a wonderful book. It's a wonderful life. And if you guys want to know more, get that book. But it's really wonderful, and it's good to spend time with you, even uh, at a distance. So thanks for doing this, Louis. My pleasure, Paul. Thanks for, thank for watching. Thanks to Charles Lego for putting it together. There's Bryce. Yes, and thank you all for.
for uh, joining us. Um, that is going to be all for our session today. But thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, please check out our page for our upcoming events. You'll you'll see Paul Zolo again uh, coming up um, with a few other guests. June and again, I if you it. haven't got your copy of uh, uh, 50 Years of Adventure, <laughs> please do so at the link right below. In the green link, you can get a signed copy by Louis Kemp. Thank you all and good night. Thank you, Thank you Louis. Thank you, Bryce. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bryce. All right.